Good afternoon. I am Chancellor Robert Jones, and I want to take just a moment to thank all of you and to welcome you to the critical conversation around free speech on campus. As most of you know, this is the second of these conversations that we have sponsored this semester. The first one around Native American imagery was one week ago, and I believe it's fair to say it was an outstanding demonstration of what can happen when you have a room full of committed and passionate individuals who are willing to put their differences aside, even if just for a moment, in order to have an honest conversation and discussion about a very difficult subject. For today's critical conversation, we're turning our attention to the issues of freedom of speech and expression on college campuses. What ideas or expressions should be off limits? Should we be creating spaces that carry specific rest restrictions on what can be said, or conversely, should we provide spaces that are specifically designed as completely free speech zones? Should our campuses be completely open venues for expression of any ideas by any individual, no matter how seemingly outrageous, offensive, or alarm alarming the topic may be? These are the kinds of questions that we are facing and that we must address as a university community. While these are certainly not new concepts or challenges, they are resurfacing today in new contexts and in new mediums and with a renewed intensity. I think that they are so hard to easily and commonly address because what we really are being asked to consider is how do we act or behave when we have two of our fundamental personal and institutional values coming into conflict. As we have seen both locally and nationally in the past couple of years, universities are becoming focal points and sometimes even flashpoints in a debate that comes up when one person's right to express an opinion seems to intrude upon another's right to personal safety and security. These are, aren't, these aren't theoretical questions or just abstract theoretical concepts for academic debate. They are very real, very tangible issues that we see playing, right, playing out here right on this campus on a very regular basis. And I think you all know exactly what I'm talking about from political protests on the quad, quad to RSO-sponsored speakers to costumes worn in athletic events, we are wrestling with how we remain true to our values of being a free marketplace of ideas and at the same time being a university that is inclusive and tolerant and protective of all opinions. So to help us figure it all out, we have invited two of the national recognized experts to join us today to offer their perspective on just what free speech on college campuses should really mean in our society today. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dean Irwin Shemarinsky from UC Berkeley and Professor Jeff Stone from the University of Chicago. Thank you both for joining us for today's critical conversation. I also want to take just a moment to thank our own Dick, uh, Dean uh, Vic Amar, the Dean of the College of Law, for serving as the moderator for today's event and to thank him and his staff for all the work that they have put together with the rest of the planning committee to execute today's event. Our format today is somewhat different than we used for the critical conversation last week. Dean Amar is going to formally introduce our guests and each of them will offer remarks that outline their position on this critical issue. After both have presented, Dean Amar will then spend, uh, spend some time engaging them uh, in conversations about uh, questions that are on his own mind and observation based on, observations based on some of their comments. Then with the remaining time, he will pose some questions that you, members of our audience, have submitted on cards you received when you came in today. 
So rather than having people line up at the microphone at the end, we're asking you to please use these cards to submit your questions that occur to you at any time during the course of the presentation or the ensuing discussion. So when you think of a question, we again ask you to write it down, hold up the card up, and a member of our staff will come and collect them. They'll be sorted, uh, we'll sort through them during the course of this discussion to look for any common themes, and then pass them along to Dean Omar, who will pose the question to our guests. He'll try to get through as many of these questions as we can, but please understand with um, many possible subjects that will be addressed and the complexity of these, uh, this subject, we may not be able to get through all of them. So once again, it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to welcome you for being part of this critical conversation today around free speech on college campuses. And so let's get started by please welcoming our moderator, Dean Vic Amar. Dean Amar. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. And I don't want to take too much time introducing these guys because their resumes are really long and we, I want to hear from them and not just um, uh, uh, cite their accomplishments. But uh, briefly, um, these are two legends in uh, the law and in the legal academy. I first met Irwin over 20 years ago when I was a very junior uh, academic at UCLA and Irwin was already an established con law uh, force at USC. Uh, Erwin, let me say publicly, I considered you a role model, a professional role model then, and I still do today. Thank you. Erwin um, went on from USC to be a professor at Duke and then the founding dean of the UC Irvine Law School. And as of last year, he is a chaired professor and the dean of the UC Berkeley uh, Law School. Uh, he is a constitutional generalist. He's written about every aspect of the Constitution. Uh, including free speech, and uh, of particular note, he wrote, co-wrote this book with the former, uh, with the uh, chancellor of UC Irvine, Free Speech on Campus, which is a great little primer I, I recommend to all of you. Uh, Jeff, believe it or not, I actually met you before I met Irwin. When I applied to law school, University of Chicago was the first school that admitted me about which I was excited. I wrote a letter to you and to Cass Sunstein, um, and you both wrote me back. Um, this was in the days before email. And um, although I ended up uh, going to Yale, it was not because of anything you said. Indeed, um, I think you convinced me that uh, um, if things didn't work out at Yale, that Chicago was the best law school in the country. Um, Jeff is uh, also a constitutional generalist, has written books and, uh, and articles about so many aspects of the Constitution. But I think it's fair to say Jeff is the leading First Amendment doctrinal scholar of his generation. Uh, I don't say that lightly, but when I was a student at Yale, I learned more about First Amendment doctrine from reading Jeff's articles than from any professor I had. Uh, he went on to become the dean of the University of Chicago Law School, provost of the University of Chicago, and he is now uh, the, uh, the uh, levy uh, uh, the chair at, at the law school. So with due thanks to both of you, let me turn it over first to Erwin to talk for 10 or 12 minutes, uh, and then to Jeff to lay out a big picture, and then we'll explore some themes uh, that you both uh, put on the table. It's such an honor and a great pleasure to be here and very special to be with Vic Amar and Jeff Stone, who I admire so much. I've often had the sense that every generation believes that it's the first to really discover sex. Likewise, <laughs> I've often had the sense that every generation believes that it's the first to really discover protests on campus. But the reality is speech, protests have occurred on campuses as long as there have been colleges and universities. Yet I also have the sense that things have changed. The image so much of us have with regard to speech on campus was shaped by what occurred in the free speech movement at Berkeley in the mid-1960s. That was about students wanting the ability to speak on campus about things unrelated to university activities. It was about administrators trying to stop the student demonstrations. Now so often it's about outsiders wanting to use the campus as their platform. People like Milo Yiannopoulos, Ann Coulter, Richard Spencer. Often now it's about outside groups coming to try to stop them from being able to speak. Also, I think there's a change in terms of student attitudes with regard to speech. I've certainly seen this with regard to my students. There was a survey done by the Pew Research Institute that found that 40% of undergraduates surveyed believe that campuses should restrict offensive or racist speech. As I participated in discussions about free speech on campus, I realized increasingly that it's important to separate a discussion 
of what's the current law from what should be the law. In fall at Berkeley, there was supposed to be a free speech week where Milo Yiannopoulos, Ann Coulter, Steve Bannon were all going to come. And the chancellor, Carol Chris, convened a campus-wide event to discuss this with a number of faculty members on the panel. One of the faculty members very powerfully said that he thought that white supremacy was the largest problem in our society and that the chancellor should exclude any racist speakers from campus, whatever the First Amendment requires. He got resounding applause. In the question and answer period, one of the students very eloquently said that she felt threatened when there were hateful speakers on campus, and she wanted the chancellor to stand up for the students and exclude such speakers, even if it meant violating the First Amendment. Towards the end of the discussion, I, as a member of the panel, spoke up, and I said, let's be clear about what the law is here. I said, if the chancellor were to exclude these speakers, she would get sued and she would lose. When Auburn University excluded Richard Spencer, he and his supporters sued and won. The university was responsible for paying the excluded speaker's attorney's fees. Since the chancellor is violating clearly established law, she might be personally liable for money damages. The excluded speakers would portray themselves as victims and martyrs. They would get to speak anyway, so nothing would be achieved by excluding them. No one applauded when I said that. <laughs> So let me quickly summarize what I regard as the most important principles of law here. Three points. First, all ideas and views can be expressed on a college campus, period. Now I'm here speaking of public universities. The First Amendment applies only to the government. It's a more complicated story if we're talking about private universities. In California, there's a statute, the Leonard Law, that says that private universities cannot punish speech that cannot be punished by public universities because of the First Amendment. Also, faculty and student handbooks often contain provisions that say that free speech will be protected. Some courts have said those constitute a contract with faculty and students, respectively. But at least when it comes to public institutions, all ideas and views can be expressed. And this includes if they're deeply offensive. As a quick illustration of this, there was a Supreme Court case earlier this decade, Snyder versus Phelps. It involved a small church out of Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church. They made it a practice of going to funerals, those who died in military service. They used those as the event for expressing a very vile anti-gay, anti-lesbian message. Matthew Snyder died as a Marine in military service in Iraq. The members of the Westboro Baptist Church traveled from Kansas to Maryland where the funeral was being held. Before the funeral, the members of the church asked police officers where they could lawfully stand. The officer pointed an area about 1,000 feet away from the funeral to be conducted. Before the funeral, the members of the Westboro Baptist Church chanted and sang. During it, they were silent, but they held up signs. That night, Matthew's father, Albert Snyder, was watching the news. He was able to read what was on the signs. He was deeply offended. He sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress and invasion of privacy. A jury awarded him $10 million. But the Supreme Court 8 to 1 held that the liability violated the First Amendment. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court and said, the government cannot create liability or punish speech on the grounds it's offensive, even deeply offensive. Second principle. Free speech is not absolute. There are categories of unprotected speech. We're all familiar with the idea that free speech is, of course, not absolute. It's just late Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes who said, there's no right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. There's three categories of unprotected speech that are relevant to our discussion today. One is incitement of illegal activity. There's no First Amendment right to incite people to commit crimes. But it's important to separate the colloquial use of the term incitement from the legal test. The legal test for incitement comes from Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969. There the court said advocacy can be punished if there's a likelihood of imminent illegal activity and if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. Imagine an angry crowd on campus. Imagine a speaker exhorts that crowd to break windows, to commit acts of violence. I don't think that would be speech protected by the First Amendment. 
Second category of speech that's unprotected is what the Supreme Court has said are true threats. There's no First Amendment right to cause a person to reasonably fear for imminent danger to his or her physical safety. It was a Supreme Court case in the mid-1960s, United States versus Watts, that first used these words, true threats. There the court held a federal law that makes it a federal crime to threaten the President of the United States. The Supreme Court said it's important to distinguish between mere hyperbole and a true threat. Imagine a student is walking across campus. Imagine an angry group surrounds the student, yells things at the student that causes the individual to fear for his or her bodily safety. Even if no blows are struck, I think the speakers can be punished because it was a true threat. Third category of unprotected speech is harassment. There's not a whole lot of law yet in terms of when does speech become harassment for purpose of the First Amendment, not being protected speech. There is a lot of law in the context of the workplace. Most obvious example, if an employer says to an employee, sleep with me, you're fired, there'd be no defense to a sexual harassment suit for the employer to say, but I was just engaging in speech. In the context of the workplace, the law is that generally to be harassment, the speech has to be directed at somebody, or sufficiently pervasive to materially interfere with employment opportunities based on race or sex or religion or sexual orientation. I think the same can be followed with regard to the campus, if the speech is directed at somebody, or if it's so pervasive as to interfere with educational opportunities, it wouldn't be protected by the First Amendment. I want to compare two examples. There was an incident at the University of California, San Diego, where somebody draped over a chair in the library, shelf in the library, would appear to be a noose. There was also an incident um, at Duke University where somebody put over a tree branch would appear to be a noose. It's a vile symbol of hate, but it wouldn't be regarded as a true threat. It wouldn't be regarded as harassment by itself. But imagine that somebody tacked onto the door of a dormitory, a room occupied by an African-American student, would appear to be a noose. I think that would be harassment would be a true threat as well. You'll notice what I didn't include in my categories of unprotected speech. Hate speech. So many people ask me, what's the line between free speech and hate speech? <laughs> and the answer is, hate speech generally is protected under the First Amendment as free speech. You might remember an incident in Skokie, Illinois, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Skokie is a suburb north of Chicago. It then had a large Jewish population and a significant number of Holocaust survivors. That's why the Nazi party chose it for a demonstration. Skokie did everything it could to exclude the Nazis, but every court to rule on it found that the Nazis had the First Amendment right to demonstrate in Skokie. Or to give an example from the Supreme Court, case of 1992, RAV versus City of St. Paul. St. Paul, Minnesota adopted an ordinance prohibiting burning a cross or painting a swastika in a manner like the anger, alarm, or cause resentment. These are vile symbols of hate. But the Supreme Court unanimously declared that law unconstitutional. Why is it that hate speech is protected in this country when most European nations outlaw it? In part, I think it's the difficulty of defining what's hate speech in a way that's not unduly vague or overbroad. In the early 1990s, over 350 college universities adopted hate speech codes. Everyone to be considered by a court without exception was declared unconstitutional. The University of Michigan adopted a hate speech code after a series of ugly incidents on that campus. It prohibited speech that stigmatized or demeaned on the basis of race, or sex, or religion, or sexual orientation. But what does it mean to stigmatize or demean? Also, experience with hate speech codes in the United States and hate speech laws in Europe should cause us some pause. Much more often than not, they're used against the very groups that they mean to protect. At the University of Michigan, every enforcement action under the code before it was declared unconstitutional <coughs> was against African American and Latino students. But maybe most of all, hate speech is protected in this country because it expresses an idea albeit a deeply offensive, vile idea. And all ideas and views are protected by the First Amendment. Third and final point 
campuses can have time, place, and manner restrictions so long as they leave adequate alternative places for communication. Campuses can have time, place, and manner restrictions so as to prevent disruption of campus activities, so as to protect safety. As an example, the former campus could say, no protests or demonstrations in classroom buildings while classes are in session. That's to prevent the disruption of regular campus activities. Campuses have both the legal and the moral duty to protect the safety of students, staff, and faculty. And they can use time, place, and manner restrictions for this. Last summer, when I arrived at Berkeley, the Chancellor, Carol Christ, very kindly asked for my advice about dealing with the coming free speech events. I said, to the greatest extent possible, have the most controversial speakers in auditoriums like this. Because you require tickets or identification. If necessary, you can have metal detectors that can police to secure the perimeters. If it's out in the middle of campus at Berkeley Sproul Plaza, that's not possible to do. You can have speakers on campus be in the areas where they're least likely to pose safety risks, least likely disruptive, so long as there's adequate places for communication. I very quickly sketched the basic principles, but of course, there's so many unanswered questions. When does speech cross the line to incitement? When does speech become a true threat? When does speech become harassment? How much do campuses have to spend in order to protect safety? where they just can't afford to have the speaker? What other things can campuses do to meet their obligation to create inclusive learning environments for all students? And these are the issues I'm sure we'll talk about, and these are the ones that campus all over the country are now trying to grapple with. Thank you so much, Erwin. Uh, Jeff? So Erwin just demonstrated the advantage of going first. <laughs> first mover. Um, I, I have to say I agree with every word uh, that Erwin uttered. Um, so the University of Chicago, unlike the University of Illinois or the University of California, is a private, not a public institution. Therefore, it is not governed by the constraints imposed by the First Amendment. The Constitution, and the First Amendment in particular, apply only to government entities. And therefore, the University of Chicago, from a constitutional standpoint, is free to do whatever it pleases with respect to the free speech opportunities that students and faculty and speakers from outside the institution might have. Uh, nonetheless, the University of Chicago has historically taken a very strong position in favor of the right of freedom of expression on campus, including students, faculty, and invited speakers. Um, and it's done so because of the commitment that the university has to the belief that the way in which ideas can be developed and tested is by, is by debate and by disagreement and by challenging and by learning. And understanding that ideas that we may hold today as clearly correct may turn out to be false and inaccurate. And the only way to test those ideas is to allow people to do so and to challenge them. So Chicago has taken the view, followed by the vast majority, I should say, of, of private institutions in the United States that is actually quite similar to what the First Amendment imposes upon public institutions. Um, and at Chicago, as at the University of California, um, we basically adhere to the position that anyone who is invited in, in, to campus by faculty or students or by any other entity authorized to issue such invitations is free to speak and cannot be censored or disciplined because the ideas expressed are deemed to be offensive or hateful or odious to some or even all members of the community. It is not the role of the university as an institution to rule certain ideas out of bounds. It is the role of the university to enable students, faculty, and community members to air ideas, to challenge themselves, to hear um, arguments made that they may find uncomfortable, and to let them figure out for themselves what they should and should not believe. Now, let me say a little bit about why perhaps the current phenomenon has come into being. Because although, as Urban noted, there is a history, of course, of um, protests on campus, uh, the current moment is somewhat different because now we have, for the most part, students who are demanding censorship of ideas that they find 
inappropriate or loathsome or uh, offensive. And historically, students have tended to be the champions of free speech, whether it was during World War I when universities were shutting down uh, criticism of the war or the draft, or whether it was during the McCarthy era when universities were, was, were following in the era of McCarthyism um, and silencing or firing individuals or, or expelling students because they held communist views. Um, and basically, students were the advocates and champions of free speech. And now, at least at this particular moment, and with respect to this type of speech, that seems to have flipped. So an interesting question is, why has that happened? And I don't purport to have the, quote, right answer to that question. But I think, based on my conversations with students um, and my experience with students, that several factors, I think, have contributed to this. Um, one of them, one that students don't like to hear, um, is that this generation of students, more than their predecessors, uh, were raised by so-called helicopter parents uh, who were shielded and protected uh, from all sorts of defeat and insult and challenge, um, and therefore arrived at college without the kind of resilience that many of their predecessors had developed in the past. And because of that, they came with a kind of expectation that they would be safe, that they would not be made uncomfortable. And that this, I think, has contributed to the sense of, of current students that they should not have to be in an environment in which ideas are conveyed that make them feel unwelcome or marginalized or uncomfortable. A second factor, I think, has to do with the fact that our colleges and universities today have much greater diversity than they did 20, 30 years ago. And I've gone back in the last couple of years and talked to some of my students from 30 years ago, minority students, gay students, women students, and asked them, did you feel uncomfortable? Did you feel marginalized? Did you feel unwelcome at times when you were at this institution? And to a person, they said, yes. I said, did you talk about it? Did you tell anyone? And they basically said, no. And I said, why not? They said, well, I would have been perceived as a whiner. And, and, and I would have been looked at as a weak person, and that was not what I, how I wanted to be perceived, particularly because of the role I felt for myself in the institution. Um, and now we've reached a point when there's a critical mass, I think, of minority students, defining minority in a broad way, um, who feel much more empowered to speak out and to talk about with the alienation and the marginalization that they fear and they feel. And I think that's a healthy thing. I think it's important for us as university administrators to understand what the experience of our students actually is and to take seriously our responsibility to create an environment that is, in fact, inclusive and that does not exacerbate the, the sense of marginalization and alienation that many of our minority students feel. So I think that's an important responsibility. However, I don't think censorship is the way to get there. But it is something I think universities and colleges today have to begin paying much more serious attention to. The third factor, I think, that has exacerbated this is the advent of social media. Um, when I grew up, um, mainstream media would never uh, convey ideas or, or symbols or materials that were perceived as truly hateful. And if they did, it was very rare and, and very unusual. And in a locker room, you might hear someone make really offensive comments. But basically, that kind of speech was understood to be completely inappropriate. And therefore, one didn't encounter it nearly as much. In a world of social media, um, that sort of hateful speech has become much more pervasive. And that's had, I think, two effects. First of all, the people who are the targets of that speech feel much more powerfully the extent to which there is hatred and venom out there directed towards them. And second, students who are not themselves the targets of the speech, but see their classmates and their friends being the victims of that kind of speech, have developed a kind of empathy that makes them want to stand up for those students and to challenge the people who are engaging in this speech. So I think that, again, is a positive response to an ugliness that has become much more pervasive at the present time. But again, I would say none of that is a sufficient justification for censorship. It's a justification for education, for setting examples, for talking about civility and mutual respect by encouraging those values, um, but not by silencing speakers. And when I talk to students and student groups about these issues, one of the key points I try to impress upon them is the danger of any particular group at any moment in time feeling that the speech they want to censor should be censored. 
without realizing that once they do that, they open the door to letting others censor them in the future. And that they have to understand that if censorship had been generally allowed in our society and in our educational institutions, that we probably would never have had a civil rights movement or a women's movement or a gay rights movement. There were majorities at various times in our history that have shut that speech down. And if they were allowed to do that, this would be a very different society. And the thing they have to understand is if they legitimate censorship, then down the road they are opening the door to allowing others to censor them. And for minorities who in a university may feel empowered, because universities tend to be quite different from the society at large, um, they may be able to get their way. But when they enter the world at large, that's not going to be what happens. And if, in fact, censorship becomes seen as much more tolerable, in the end, they are going to be the losers. And it's very important, I think, for students to understand that and to recognize that for their, their own self-interest is to insist upon their right to speak openly. And to do that, you have to also insist upon the right of others with whom you disagree to speak openly as well. Very helpful. Let me pick up uh, just uh, briefly on the last point Jeff made. It, it, to my mind, it actually points to yet another factor that accounts for the unusual moment we have. You know, maybe I'm just getting old. That's part of it. But I sense that people come to universities these days with much less appreciation of some basic American history. Um, so part of it is really educating people about the, the uh, abolitionist movement and the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the, the uh, uh, sexual equality movement. But let's go back to um, uh, the, the, some issues on which you two may disagree. I think it's heartening that the two of you agree, but in a lot of ways you're similar. You're prominent, mainstream, liberal, constitutional uh, academics, uh, although I think conservative constitutional academics would agree with pretty much everything Erwin said as well. At least at the moment. At least at the moment. Um, but let me mention a couple of things that, on which you might disagree. Let's start with something that Erwin talks about in the, his book, um, and that is that oftentimes one thing a university can and should do, in addition to time, place, and manner regulations and prohibiting threats and, and harassment and the like, is the university should weigh in itself, should engage in speech itself to um, kind of be on record as opposing some bad ideas, even if those ideas uh, have a right to be expressed by, uh, by people. I have a sense that the University of Chicago, and you in particular, Jeff, are a little bit less optimistic about the role that a university can play. I'm wondering maybe whether this is one instance where a public university, and generally we, we are scared of government speech relative to private speech, but maybe it's more important for public universities to be on record as opposing some bad ideas than private universities that can basically just be a neutral uh, referee. But let me get your thoughts, uh, uh, both of you, on this question of when is it appropriate, when is it almost mandatory that university should speak out uh, even if, as it's allowing others to say bad things? Erwin? Just as Oliver and the Holmes said, that the best remedy for the speech that we don't like is more speech. I don't in <laughs> any way minimize the harms of hate speech. I think that scholars such as Richard Delgado and Charles Lawrence and Mario Matsuda have very powerfully described the ways in which hate speech can make those who have traditionally been excluded from the campus feel unwelcome. But I do think that it's very important when there's hateful incidents on campus for campus officials to speak out use their power of more speech. And I've seen this at both private and public universities. Many years ago when I was teaching at the University of Southern California, somebody wrote a homophobic slur on a board. Rather than try to figure out who did it and punish the student, the then Dean Scott Weiss put a letter in every student and faculty mailbox, that shows you how long ago this was, condemning the hate speech and explaining why it's inconsistent with the kind of community we want to be. We had an incident at University of California Berkeley Law School this past fall when Alan Dershowitz spoke, controversial Harvard Law professor, strong supporter of President Trump, strong supporter of the current Israeli government's policies. Someone drew a swastika over his picture. I learned about it at 4 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. At 8 o'clock Thursday morning, I had a note go to all faculty, staff, and students condemning the hate speech and explaining why it's inconsistent with the kind of community we want to be. Not that long ago, I was at a program where the general counsel of the University of Mississippi was present. And he said, every time there's a hateful incident on campus, given the history of that campus, the president of the university feels the need to speak out. To me, it's a strategic question. I don't want to speak out so much that people stop paying attention to what I say. 
I know that I have to pick your spots. Pick the spots, but I do think that when hateful things go on, it's my obligation to speak out. And I think I would take that position whether I was at a public or a private university. Sounds reasonable, Jeff. Why would you pick fewer spots if you would? So the University of Chicago has a policy called the Calvin Report, uh, which was authored by a First Amendment scholar Harry Calvin back in the late 1960s uh, during the conflicts over the Vietnam War. And at this time, uh, students at the University of Chicago, um, including myself, I should say, uh, participated in protests demanding that the university should condemn the Vietnam War as illegitimate and immoral and something that uh, the government should, uh, should extricate itself from. Uh, and the university took the view in the report that Harry Calvin wrote that basically said that the university should not take positions on matters of public policy unless the issues directly affect the core functioning of the university itself. And the rationale of, and the reasoning behind that, that judgment was that university should be a place in which faculty, students, community members feel completely free to advocate whatever positions and ideas they believe should be advocated and should be advanced. And that for the university, as big brother, to step in and say there are right and wrong ideas is to seriously interfere with the freedom and the sense of openness that students and faculty members would feel and should feel about their freedom to be able to advance the ideas and the positions um, that they think are important. And for the same reason that, that um, Irwin would tolerate what others would call hate speech on campus, Chicago would say, it is not for us to say hate speech is inappropriate. That is for you to talk about, for you to argue about, for you to disagree with. And, and so that, that has been a central precept of our own position. I think Chicago is not unique in this, but not that many universities follow this position with the same commitment. Um, and I think it is, a, is a, it is a position that is correct, because it's basically saying that insofar as we believe that there should be the freedom of all students, all faculty, to express all ideas that they think should be heard, the university should not be weighing in and saying, no, 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 those are bad ideas. So, can I, can I respond uh, yeah, so to of that? course, I, I think the um, question comes down to what are the core uh, functions of the university and when do you have to speak up to protect those? I think that's where maybe there'll be a little disagreement. But go ahead, Aaron. I, mean, I find what you say persuasive, yet I also believe that it's important in my law school and my campus to have principles of community that express the kind of place that we want to be. That's the campus speaking out. Now, that's not something that's going to be enforced by discipline or punishment. But I want to be a campus where we can say, we really respect each other, and we're going to speak respectfully to each other, even if when people don't, we're not going to punish them. Another example, which I felt just this fall, when President Trump rescinded DACA, I felt the need as a dean of the law school to speak out and condemn that policy. Because we have DACA students, and I want all of our students to feel that this is a community where they are respected and welcome, and we will do everything to protect them. So um, let, me, let me follow up on that. So DACA, you could argue, has a kind of a, a proximate effect on universities because they have DACA students. What about the president's um, entry bans, which really don't have any distinctive effect on student bodies that come to American universities? Would a university have an appropriate role in weighing in on something like that? I think that entry bans could certainly affect who comes to the campus. Anything can always affect right. the university. I would so. not choose that as the place to speak out because I wouldn't see it as so directly affecting my community. I'm always concerned, as I said, about wanting to speak enough to be effective and not so much that no one pays attention to what I have to say. Um, I think the place where I may disagree with you a little bit, Jeff, is I don't think by condemning hate speech that I'm saying anything other than I think that this is inappropriate in our community. So long as I don't punish anybody for it, I don't think I've crossed the line to something that's inappropriate for a campus administrator to do. I think it's no different from saying I think the Vietnam War is wrong, or I think that abortion is immoral, um, or I think that gay shouldn't have rights. Um, I don't, you know, if you believe in this notion of marketplace of ideas, which, which you basically say we shouldn't be saying what ideas are wrong or right by silencing people, the argument is you shouldn't be, as, as the boss, telling everybody else what you think as an institution, because that will have an effect on what students feel they can say and what faculty feel they can say, and that's the argument, at least. Great. So now let me turn to a separate um, uh, question. I'll start with you, Jeff, and we'll try to keep our answers brief. 
Um, you know, I know at the University of Chicago, uh, basically any faculty member or, or faculty or student group can issue an invitation that the university feels it has to stand behind and allow the speaker to speak. Um, but there's a lot of costs involved in that. So two-part question. One, why do you push authority down so low that anybody can basically issue an invitation that then can't easily be rescinded, even if it's somebody who is not a serious thinker, has nothing academic to say, is nothing but a rabble rouser, and then you gotta pay a lot of money uh, to provide security for it. So could you talk about both of those aspects uh, from your perspective and Chicago's perspective, and then we'll see what Irwin uh, can say based on his recent experience at Berkeley. So first, um, a university could say that only the university can issue invitations to speakers to come to campus and that we will exercise that authority in a principled and appropriate manner, uh -huh. which would mean we are not gonna make judgments about the ideas, but about the speakers. Are they people of credibility? Have they accomplished things? Universities decide whether to hire faculty members, whether to win students, what to grades make, to give grant students. Tenure. They make decisions like that all the time. Um, but pre presumably, they try very hard not to make that on the grounds of whether they agree or disagree with the ideological views expressed by the potential faculty member or the potential student um, or the exam answer. And uh, so I, I could imagine a college or university creating a system in which no one can invite anyone except the university itself, and it has to make these judgments about, about quality and so on. The problem with that is I don't think there's any legitimate reason to do that other than limits on time and money. So if you literally have so many people being invited that you can't accommodate them, then there's a need for some sort of overarching supervision. But that's not realistically the case in any institution I know of. Um, so therefore, I think the basic point is that we want to have a community in which students and faculty can bring to the campus those people whose ideas they want to hear. And they want others to have the opportunity to hear. And that unless we have a very compelling reason for not allowing that, better they should have the freedom to do that. And who pays for that? Is, is, is the security cost um, a compelling reason when, and you know, should it be the student or faculty group that did the invitation that bears the cost, the outside speaker, the central administration? These are the things I think we're all grappling with. What are your thoughts about that? Well, so generally the way universities work on this, as I understand it at least, is that, is that they allocate budgets to different units, including student groups and so on, to pay for you know, inviting speakers or paying the expenses of speakers, and when they run out of money, they run out of money. And those are reasonable judgments, and hopefully the money is allocated in a fair manner. The real question you're asking is the, is the issue of the threat of disruption, mm -hmm. and what happens there. And this is a, a very complicated and difficult issue, because as the Supreme Court recognized, um, particularly during the Civil Rights Movement, that if you allow those individuals who oppose a speaker's views to threaten violence as a way of causing the institution or the university or the, the city or whatever to shut down the speech or to prohibit the speech, then you've turned over what Harry Calvin, the same Harry Calvin who wrote the Calvin Report, uh, described as the heckler's veto. That you basically turn over to other individuals the power to decide who will get to speak and who will not get to speak. And the Supreme Court recognized that that's completely incompatible with the city's obligation or the university's obligation to protect the rights of speakers and citizens and faculty members and so on. However, that's not an absolute responsibility. So certainly if there comes a point when the actual violence that is going to occur or is occurring is so great, a city or a university could shut down an event at that point. The anticipation question is even more complicated. Yeah. Is at what point can you say, we think the cost of ensuring the safety of this event is sufficiently great that we're gonna prevent the speaker from speaking? This is not an easy question. Obviously, universities have limited resources and you don't want to bankrupt the institution in order to spend millions of dollars to protect speakers whose presence on campus will trigger this kind of violent response and protest. So there is at least a, a, a concept that says at a certain point, the, the interest of the institution in preserving its resources um, justifies canceling an event or at least structuring the location of an event. And, but, but most of the time, I think, the reality is most of the time, institutions can manage these things much more sensibly. So before I turn around, 
uh, recognize that if, there, if we reach that point where the security costs, the fear of harm rise to the level where we need to cancel it, that's not entirely unrelated to the content or viewpoint of that no, speaker. Exactly. So it's really the backlash caused by a majority against a particular kind of unpopular speaker, at least in, in this community that's doing the work there. Yes, and, and the we, responsibility we, of the institution in that situation is to, is to punish those who are causing the violence and the disruption and to do whatever it can to prevent those situations from arising. Otherwise, it's just turning over to that group or those groups the power to decide who gets to speak on their campus. Erwin? Now it's my chance to say I agree with everything that Jess said. In terms of the first of your questions, the only thing that I add is I want to see campuses be a place where all ideas and views are expressed. I want the greatest diversity of viewpoints to be there. And I think if we had just invitations coming from the top levels of campus, we wouldn't achieve that diversity. In terms of the second, I think the cost issue is one of the hardest. Um, the cost at UC Berkeley in the fall for Free Speech Week and the security attendant to it was $3.9 million. Imagine if it wasn't a free speech week there, but they declared free speech semester. And the cost wasn't $4 million, but $50 million. That comes from the educational mission of the campus. Where is the point at which the campus can say, we just can't afford the security costs, so we're going to prevent the speakers? The chancellor at UC Berkeley, Carol Christ, asked me that question last summer as well. And I said, here, there's just not law from the lower courts or the Supreme Court mm -hmm. that provide a clear answer. I said, if I were your lawyer, and I'm not, you've got campus counsel, I would tell you you have to spend a reasonable amount of money on security. She's far too polite to roll her eyes at me, but <laughs> saying to a campus official you have to spend a reasonable amount, there's no guidance at all. I then said you have to face two questions. First, what's your stomach for litigation? If you exclude speakers because you don't want to pay the security costs, you will get sued. The law is sufficiently uncertain. No one can predict what the result will be. If you lose, you have to pay the other side's attorney's fees. And second, what do you want your message to be? And she decided, I think quite rightly, that she wanted the message to be that Berkeley is a free speech campus and absorb those costs. I got to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee of the California legislature in the fall, and I said, I really think it's the state of California that should absorb these costs for the University of California and Cal State system. That they're providing a service to the public and it shouldn't come from the educational budget of campuses. I'm not holding my breath for the state to provide the funds, yeah. but I think that's the right solution. As with your meeting at Berkeley, I don't think they cheered that either. No. At, uh, I, I can't imagine. Um, we have several questions from the audience, so let me get to a few of them. Uh, let me uh, refine the first one um, uh, with the following gloss. Uh, you know, a lot of um, episodes that we read about or see depicted on the news these days involve um, shouting down of speakers, um, you know, uh, uh, obstructing a speaker's attempt to get the message out by yelling over the speaker. Uh, and I um, wrote a column several months ago uh, in which I thought that you know, prohibiting shouting down is no different than prohibiting someone from uh, disabling a, a, a speaker or um, a microphone. It's, it's a time, place, and manner regulation. It's content neutral, et cetera. But, you know, Mark Tushnet, who's another great uh, constitutional scholar from, from uh, Harvard, um, you know, he had written something that seemed to take a little bit different position, and maybe I uh, was misunderstanding him, but he thought that because the shouting down took the form of actual speech, that, um, that there was something protected about that. Um, do you see any value from a First Amendment perspective uh, in allowing students to, or other uh, uh, opponents to physically shout down a speaker? And if not, and here's the second part, if you don't step in and enforce that, in one instance, are you creating a problem because then when you try to enforce it in another instance, it looks like you were picking and choosing among speakers? There's no First Amendment right to use speech to shout others down and silence <coughs> them. Um, you know, this happened in a lot of incidents. There was one where Michael Scholl, your former dean, um, now president of the University of Oregon, was giving a state of the campus speech, and students shouted so he couldn't be heard. There was an incident at William & Mary where an ACLU lawyer came to speak after Charlottesville, and a group from Black Lives Matter came and shouted and sang so it couldn't be heard. Several years ago at UC Irvine, the Israeli ambassador Michael Oren was speaking, 
And a group of 11 students in turn shouted so he couldn't be heard. To me, this really goes to the phrase that you use, the heckler's veto. Because if we allow the audience to silence the speaker in that way, then the only speakers we'll ever hear from are those where there's not an audience that cares enough to shout them down. So I think that campuses do have a duty to protect the ability of inspired speakers to be heard. That includes, if necessary, removing, disciplining students who are engaging in this behavior. And I think it has to be done in a viewpoint neutral way, as everything that campuses do with regard to speech has to be viewpoint neutral. But one of the things you wrote in your book I thought that was interesting was, you know, that in any given setting, how aggressively you enforce the time, place, and manner restriction may depend on um, how, many, how much resources it would involve and, and, and how, how escalation could occur, et cetera. And I agree with all that, and yet I also think that when you don't enforce things pretty flatly, you open yourself up to the charge of viewpoint discrimination for somebody connecting the dots about who's getting uh, laws enforced against them and who's not. Jeff, what's your sense of this? So I, I agree with, completely with Erwin that the First Amendment does not protect speech that is intended to disrupt others' ability to speak and to listen. That's just not even, despite what Mark, I don't know what Mark, that road, but I'll send you the links. Yeah, I appreciate that. But that's just not credible, I think, as a, uh, under existing First Amendment law. Um, I do think the real challenge in those situations is how the university handles the situation. Um, the most obvious way to handle a situation is to bring in security. And what the first thing you do is to tell whoever's disrupting, you can't do that. Assuming they continue, uh, then the next thing you can do is bring in security and drag people out. And that's what probably would have been done in the past, but in a world of, of cell phones, yes. uh, that becomes far more costly to the institution than most institutions want to inflict upon themselves. Because then it winds up on social media, and it looks as if the, the university is intolerant, and that it's brutal, and it's harming its students, and, and it's easy then to be manipulated into not being willing to do the obvious thing, which is simply remove the people. Uh, the alternative is to discipline people, that is, if it's a student or a faculty member, you can bring them up before appropriate disciplinary bodies, and you can discipline them after the fact for their behavior, in the same way you could for plagiarism, for example. Um, but the problem with that is it doesn't stop the event. It doesn't enable the event to go forward, so they win at least at the moment. And the other thing is you can't reveal what penalties you inflict upon people for other reasons wholly removed from this, which means that you don't get the deterrent effect that you normally would get in the real world by, say, criminally prosecuting someone. Because of educational privacy laws. Yeah, educational privacy laws about, 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 pun about uh, punishment. So it's a real dilemma for universities to figure out exactly how to cope with this. Um, and I, I, I don't think there's a simple, obvious right answer there. Uh, at the very least, I think universities should, in fact, have clear rules about this, and they should be willing to enforce them. The hardest question is, do you pull people out of the room during the event? I would say that's probably what you should do, but I understand why university officials are extremely reluctant to do that. Good. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in three more, one for Jeff, one for Erwin, and then one for both of you. Uh, this uh, comes from the audience. This is for Jeff. Jeff, who or what do you think is the biggest threat to the First Amendment and free speech today? Um, in the university context, I think I would say, and this is a little off the subject, but I think it, I would say it is the effort of primarily extremely wealthy conservatives mm -hmm. to create institutions within universities mm -hmm. that are designed specifically to promote conservative ideological positions. I don't think that's off topic at all because okay. a lot of the events that we've been seeing are a result of outside influence, if not manipulation. Right. I mean, just an example. I mean, the Koch brothers, for example, have been very aggressive about trying to do this. And some universities have basically said, no, thank you. We don't want to do that. But others have said, well, yeah, we'd like to have this money to do, to do these things. And, but I, I think that's a real danger at the moment in terms of corrupting the academic integrity of these institutions. Good. Uh, Erwin, this one comes from one of my law students, so I have to ask it for you, uh, not to pro, uh, discriminate in viewpoint uh, uh, basis, but um, can student governments at public universities violate the First Amendment? Are they held to the same uh, standards? Is it really a state action question, I guess? If a student government does something, 
uh, that is uh, violative of some of your uh, core First Amendment principles, are they in trouble, or is it only kind of people like Robert and me who are higher up the university food chain? We empower the student government at Berkeley, we did at Irvine, to make certain decisions on behalf of the institution. They have money that they get to allocate. They get to invite speakers. Um, the First Amendment applies to those choices. Now, the Supreme Court in the Board of Wisconsin, Regional Wisconsin versus Southworth, has given great latitude to being able to allocate money without having to face First Amendment challenges. But the simple answer to your question is, for the choices that the university allows student government to make, I would say they're a state actor. Good. Um, okay, final question for both of you. Uh, we've talked at some length about students' rights and responsibilities and, and regulations that can uh, be imposed to uh, protect interests of others. And we've talked a little bit about the outside speakers and the, the individuals who might want to fund them or support them. Um, we haven't talked much about a third important constituency at universities, and that's faculty members. And um, in your book, Erwin, you take a pretty clean position that when a faculty member is doing scholarship or teaching, um, we can evaluate that based on its content. And Jeff, you made this point earlier, because we have to decide whether it's uh, a credible academic work, uh, whether it's, uh, it's considered uh, substantial and, and rigorous and the like. But when a faculty member is speaking outside of work, so to speak, um, as long as it's not kind of related to the field in which they work and undermining their credibility as a scholar in that sense, that they should be immune, or when you said, from punishment um, by, by even a public university bound fully by the First Amendment. And I'm just wondering how far to push that. So you give the example of a faculty member uh, who is a, a, a member of the Nazi party or a member of the KKK. And because of social media that Jeff referred to earlier, this is widely known on campus. I'm wondering if that faculty member can continue to do her job, part of which involves teaching and mentoring and being open to students and being credible to students, and isn't, isn't in, a, in a modern 21st century social media world what we do off the job, so to speak, isn't that, doesn't that bear on our fitness um, as a, um, a, a professor, given that we do more than just write scholarship. You talk about the need to be sensitive to students' desires to be treated respectfully and, and have access to, to, uh, to resources and the like. We do draw a bright line distinction between speech in the professional realm and the non-professional realm. So when it comes to faculty, there has to be content-based evaluation of their scholarship for purpose promotion or tenure. If a faculty member is assigned to teach constitutional law, they do nothing but go in and talk about basketball, it would be appropriate to say you're not doing your job. That's content-based. When we evaluate student papers, obviously it's on the quality of the content of the work. But to me, that's very different than the non-professional realm, the realm that does not go to evaluating a faculty member promotion to tenure or evaluating a student. And you're right, what a professor does off the job could certainly influence how students feel to be in his or her classroom. But or whether what, anyone would take that professor. But uh, what concerns me then is in the context of the McCarthy era, very easy then to say to faculty, we can't have professors who are suspected of or known to be members of the Communist Party because students can't learn from them. Where there's an incident at the University of Oregon um, a year ago fall where a law professor had a Halloween party in her home and she wore blackface in a medical coat there, try to express views about discrimination against minorities in the medical profession. She was suspended from teaching. There was a report that said that what she did interfered with the ability of students to learn from her because students who'd be offended by this wouldn't be able to study from her. Once we say we're going to allow a professor to be disciplined because what he or she does in a non-professional realm, then it seems to me you're really saying that there is no line here, and that any time students would be upset by what the professor is doing on Twitter, on the weekend organizations, that can be a basis for taking the professor out of the classroom, maybe off the faculty. And I'm willing to accept the fact that students may be uncomfortable with the professor, with the professor doing off the job, as opposed to giving the campuses so much control over faculty speech when they're off the job. Jeff, you agree with that? 
Yeah, I, I think that the, the right way to ask and to consider this question is simply to reverse the facts and assume that it's 1945 and a professor at the University of Alabama is writing op-eds opposing seg segregation, or it's 1960 and a woman professor uh, is writing articles about women's rights and about a right to abortion um, in an institution where that's completely incompatible with the current views of the faculty and students, um, or about gay rights. Again, I, th I think it's important here to ask, what's the principle? And the principle is, what most people would say is, well, I'm willing to get rid of the person who does the thing I don't like, but of course you shouldn't fire the person who opposes segregation in 1950 in, in Alabama. And, but it's the principle you have to adhere to. And the principle is one that requires you to step back and to be neutral about it. But is it, is it unprincipled to say at some point um, somebody can't do a job of a particular kind because she's a pariah or he's, he's, he's uh, so uh, extreme? Even in his private life, so as to have lost credibility. I mean, if I, if I, if, if you know, I'm, I'm imagining if no one is taking one of my professors in a class, and I, you know, what, am, what good is that person? I can't have them teach anything. I can't have them surf on any committee because no one gets along. I can't. So I understand the idea, but it's just it's not clear to me that in practice we wouldn't have to take this into account to some extent. I do think that there is behavior that individuals may engage in that can interfere with their ability to be effective as teachers or as colleagues, and that that certainly could be a basis for this. But if it's ideas that we're talking about, if it's ideas that are otherwise protected in public discourse, then I think one has to be extremely careful about opening the door to this. Because again, if you open the door to this, you go back to my hypotheticals, and you've got to be consistent. And then the University of Alabama can fire any professor who talks about criticizing segregation. And I think Do you really want to go there? I think that's a great note to close on because as, as Jeff mentioned earlier on, we have to think about these issues um, in a larger historical context. So whenever you're not sure about whether um, someone should have a right to do something, just change the content, change the message, uh, and change the historical or geographical setting and ask how your instincts would be. So with that, let me thank uh, our, uh, our presenters and thank Chancellor Jones for convening this event and thank the audience for participating.